Here we go. Here we go. Keep it rocking. Keep it moving. Hi, dude. It's been Hello. too long. Bless you, sir. Nice to, nice to see your face. I also, uh, I also heard the song. I thought it was very cool, especially when it like kicked in with the lyrics. I'm like, go Demetrios. He's got some production skills over here. I liked it. That is a lot of what we would call auto-tune. And so <laughs> there has been no AI that was used in this. Uh, like I didn't generate any of the beats with AI, except you could potentially argue that auto-tune has, it's a little bit of machine learning slash AI. So I don't know. I, I think it was a bona fide classic. That's what I think. There we go. That's what I'm talking about, Kai. That's why I bring you on here, man. I knew there was a good reason that we had you as a speaker. <laughs> anyway, yeah, so, so I'm going to speak a little bit about Helix, which is a project, you know, my co-founder, Luke. We, we, uh, I've heard of that guy. We've, we've worked before in the past together. Um, we, and should yeah. we tell everyone? So real fast, let's yeah, just sure, tell that's the, cool. Why not? Let's tell them the quick story because there is a story to be told. <laughs> and I want to let everyone know. So Kai and I work together and uh basically we worked with luke who we're talking about and luke was the ceo of this company called dot science and when COVID hit all of a sudden all of a sudden the company went out of business and so then boom we were like oh no we don't have jobs anymore except turned out to be a blessing in disguise for like nine out of ten of us because Kai, you went on to do great things with your life. Uh, the community went on to be created because of that. And here we are, man. I think I think definitely that moment can be attributed as the, the, the forging place of this great community. And I, I mean, it's down to you, the what you might say, the forge master. <laughs> but yes, we, we just discussed the origins of community, And it was an exciting time, man. Like I said, and well done. I applaud you. Yeah. Um, Dude, couldn't yeah. have done it without you. So, well, all right, talk to us. Talk to us about Helix. What you and Luke have been up to? And... So, so, yeah, uh, Helix is uh, an exciting project. Um, I was working with Luke last year. Um, we were actually doing. Um, a, I'm just gonna not, I'm not go into details, but it was a, a, a decentralized marketplace for AI, right? So it kind of had that Venn diagram of like crypto plus AI. Woohoo! Um, it was a cool project. Um, and then this, um, we have no mo uh, uh, memo kind of came out of Google, right? And they were like, oh no, open source is gonna come for our lunch. And it was, it was an interesting debate. Now I put a question mark there, cause like, you know, who knows how, and especially today, if you've seen OpenAI's video model, then they clearly still have a bit of a moat, right? But who knows how this is gonna go? But me and Luke, we were, we were discussing this and, Oh, open source stands a chance, especially if you remember this thing called Windows versus Linux and like what is going to end up running the Internet question mark. It feels like a similar thing. And Linux in my head won that because open source beats out all the edge cases you could possibly do inside a company. Anyway, there's a big debate like who's going to win this race. Then we started talking about like. But regardless of who wins the big fat model race, what does it look like if you take domain specific knowledge and you fine tune a smaller model uh, with less parameters? And so like, that sounds like an interesting idea. Uh, let's park that for a bit. And then I'm not quite sure what happened, but we, we decided to then just start a company and build the thing. Uh, and then Mistral 7B, which I'm sure a lot of you know, but if you don't, then it's an open source model. It performs very well. Mixtral, which is like the mixture of experts, uh, architecture comes out of the same guys that made, that made Mistral. Like, it performs very well, and you can fine tune it on a 4090, it turns out, which is kind of exciting for me because I'm sat there with a 4090. I don't have a big rack of GPUs to play around with. But um, so we, we got to work and we thought to ourselves, what would it look like if you put a UI, like, just like ChatGPT, that kind of aha moment where you have, you know, ask it a question, it comes back with the answer. You're like, whoa, this is actually. You know, for I guess the next word machine, this is actually really good at what it does, and it's impressed. It's impressed me. So, but you can't kind of install it on your own computers. Was the hypothesis we were playing with, and hence let's build Helix, which is just like a, a UI deployable platform for running best of breed open source models in in a nutshell, but with a a, a kind of a, a distinct lean towards making fine tuning easier, um, and that's basically the core tenet of Helix. Now. Uh, 
it's not to say fine tuning is better than RAG. We are actually building RAG retrieval augmented generation features into Helix as well, because it's not like we, you know, we're not trying to bang the drum. We think fine tuning is the way forward. Clearly, you know, one is a chisel, the other is a hammer and pick the right tool. Maybe combine them. That's also possibly we're going to yield better results. We're speaking about evaluation just now and like, let's use these evaluation frameworks, find out what approach is better. The, the key thing with Helix we're trying to do though, is make it really easy to do the fine tuning, right? And so, you know, click and drag your documents. You have to make these question answer pairs, which is, I didn't, I had no idea about this, but it turns out this is a core tenet because the large language models are really good at guessing the next word, but they don't really understand the concept of a question, right? They're just like, you know, using math, I'm going to guess the next word would be. But so, so what we have to do to fine tune nice as, uh, you know, make good fine tuned models as a service is also uh have the question answer generation step very much part of the workflow so ideally the workflow is drag your documents in it cracks on with a nice ui as you can see in the background and once it's finished it tells you here it is now as part of that process though we need to kind of go from this like here is some text which is the documents you uploaded your pdfs or your word documents it's just a stream of tokens and we kind of need to convert those into the sorts of questions that the end users of this model might ask, right? Um, and so we actually use a large language model in that step as well, which is uh, we kind of go through all the documents and we chunk down into smaller bits and then we get a large language model to say, give me a list of questions that represent this text. And we do that in lots of different prompts. And it's actually that step that leads to the higher quality of uh, fine tunes. And, and uh, Demetrios mentioned how we got uh, um, fine tuning Mistral not to suck. And it was a blog post that Luke put out last week, which is basically kind of like the culmination of our efforts in making significant leaps forward with the quality of our fine tune because we're doing the question answer step uh, much more rigorously, might be the way I say it. I see we're doing a lot more of it and diff different. But here on the screen here, it's just this kind of process of saying, like, given the raw text, let me generate a question answer pair, which then the fine tune model would know how to complete if asked that question. Um, so a quick diagram to kind of explain our workflow underneath the, the hood is upload your documents, uh, you know, PDFs, HTML document, uh, uh, Word documents or URLs, you know, essentially unstructured or Llama index, these sorts of tools that will do the extract bit for you. Uh, we're actually using them under the hood, right? So uh, get me the plain text out of all of the stuff you've put in um, convert that plain text into question answer pairs using a large language model. Uh, we actually use mix, Mixtral to do that because it turns out to be much better at uh, producing quality QA pairs. Um, that gives you your data set and then you can fine tune from that data set. Uh, we use Axolotl under the hood, but we're also poking around with all sorts of different uh, projects that will allow you to fine tune various different open source models, right? So our UI and our control plane is very agnostic when it comes to what actual model we use. At the moment, it's Mistral uh, and Mixtral to do the QA pair generation. Um, and that, this is one of my favorite slides because it's like what happens once you've done all of that is like without really knowing it, the AI now knows something completely new. And that's really useful, it turns out, for specific use cases. So um it's like neo from the matrix i don't know how but now i know kung fu and that's the lora file but the low rank adaptation file it's essentially kind of like a boost for the weights it's beyond my pay grade to tell you any more about how that stuff actually works i'm sure there's lots of people in the community to explain it uh, happily but our job is to produce those lora files by clicking and dragging and then get inference sessions to happen that use those lower files. Um, and also to talk about um, some other use cases, like I'm uh, looking at time here, so not to go on and on, but obviously code is a really important one. Fine tuning a language model on your code base. That could be interesting, especially when it comes to like, hey, write me a thing just like I've written 20 other things, um, but with some um, fuzziness thrown in, that could be an incredibly useful version of Copilot, which is single-handedly single the most productive tool I've ever installed on my computer anyway. But for getting it to know my code base it would be the reason to do fine tuning on, on code. Um, voice would be another one. Uh, a use case we've, we've been toying around with is has been the, uh, what happens if your star salesperson leaves? Uh, and it's just like their kind of tone and character was actually what made them a star salesperson. And we could fine tune a language model on all of their communication and such forth. Um, 
that might be very interesting. Um, how am I doing for time? Just looking at a couple more minutes. So let me crack on for a couple of minutes. Here's a really important part of this whole thing is uh, because it's open source models, um, you can run it on your own infrastructure. And, and I think that's uh, one of our distinct hypotheses is, is that companies who have strong regulatory concerns with where they can send their data, like they, they would love to use GPT-4, right? They, they can see the value, but they can't be sending their data off to the US. And they would love to get their hands on similar quality models. And so if you can say here as a platform, you could run on your infrastructure running open source models. That's one of our hypotheses. And I think the um, the other one is like, can we actually be the go to SaaS platform for open source models? Right. Which is clearly a different play altogether. And, we're, you know, who knows? We're still finding out which we think might be the best thing. We're getting some signal in both places is what I would say. Um, last part i will talk about because this is running uh ai in production is like we've done some tricks when it comes to using gpu memory efficiently because there's a lot of io latency when it comes to taking lower files and base uh, foundation model weights and sticking them into vram and then running inference on them so you need a kind of multi-tenant solution to this there's projects like vllm and other things that are like let's run inference at scale in production um, not all of them will support every format of LoRa file. So you have these interesting, uh, let me call it compatibility matrices where you come to run all of these different things on servers. But the key thing we've realized is like boot, boot a model and its weight into memory and then run multiple inference sessions in a multi-tenant way on that same model instance. Um, that's been something we've had to solve because obviously we're running in, in production clusters of uh, GPUs, but also when we install this for people on premise, they would also want to connect it to clusters of GPUs and use the same management layer uh, that we've got for Helix. So I'm gonna I'm gonna throw that up in the air and say that's my quick 10 minute, probably hopefully that was about 10 minute brain dump of of, of Helix and say to Dimitrios, um, back to you. Uh, uh, do you have any questions? We ain't got time for questions, man. Are you crazy? <laughs> we we front loaded this with a story. <laughs> We did, hell? didn't we? <laughs> I, I, yeah, well, I, 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 will. I, I was like launching the clock. Going, no, hurry up, hurry up. <laughs> Dude, it was awesome, though. And I will say that uh, two things. Jump in the chat if you want any questions. And there's, uh, there's some people that are mentoring that they have questions. So, yes, there are questions coming through the chat. You did say one thing that I think is just perfect timing. You said uh, Copilot is one of the most productive tools that you have. Guess what? <laughs> We've got Bryant coming on. Yeah. Where you at, Bryant? Bryant's wow. coming hey. on. You hear me? What do you do, Bryant? What, what kind of stuff do you work on? <laughs> I work on GitHub Copilot as well as any other GitHub uh, product in general. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> yeah, Kai is very job. happy with that. <laughs> All right, Kai, thanks so much, man. It's Thank always you, you always brighten up my day. I appreciate it. Thank and you, Thank we'll you. let you go to the chat and answer all the questions. Awesome.